in the 1970s, um, the American Psychiatric Association decided that for the first time, they were going to standardize how they defined depression. Because up to then, doctors were just calling anything they wanted depression, right? So they decided we're going to define depression properly. So they, they wrote a fairly basic um, definition, and it's things people could guess. They drop a checklist of 10 symptoms, things like crying a lot, feeling life isn't worth living. And they said to psychiatrists, if any of your patients have more than six of these 10 symptoms for more than two weeks, you should diagnose them as mentally ill and do what you can to help them. So this checklist is sent out to psychiatrists all over the United States. But within a few months, some of them start to come back and go, look, we've got a bit of a problem here. If we use this checklist the way you've told us to, we're going to have to define every grieving person as mentally ill because mm -hmm. these are the symptoms of grief, right? Mm -hmm. And the American Psychiatric Association said, oh, shit, that's not what we meant, right? We didn't, we didn't mean that. So they invented what became known as the grief loophole. They said, okay, if any of your patients have more than six of these 10 symptoms for more than two weeks, define them as mentally ill, unless someone they love has died in the last year, in which case they're not crazy, they're not mentally ill, you shouldn't give them any treatment, right? But so psychiatrists started applying that, but then that begged the obvious question, why is someone you love dying the only reason where you're allowed to feel really bad and not mm. be classed as mentally ill? Why not if you've lost your job? Yeah. Why not if you're stuck in a job you hate for the next 40 years? Why not if you've been made homeless? We can all think of immediate examples, right? Mm. And you can see how these, what appears to be a neutral science is in fact based on these profoundly capitalist values. Yeah. Because if you allow all of that context into psychiatry, yeah. then you start diagnosing the society, not the individual, right? Mm. Actually, why have we got a society where so many people are unhappy? One of the heroes of my book is um, an amazing man named Dr. Sam Everington. So he's a general practitioner in East London. And Sam was really uncomfortable. He's a poor part of East London where I lived for many years. And Sam was really uncomfortable because he had loads of patients coming to him who had just terrible depression and anxiety. And like me, he's not opposed to chemical antidepressants. He thinks they have some role to play. But he could see two things. Firstly, that his patients were depressed and anxious for perfectly understandable reasons yeah. in, in the vast majority of cases, like they were really lonely and, 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 or financially insecure. And secondly, he could see that chemical antidepressants gave them a bit of relief, but didn't actually solve the problem for most of them. So one day he had this idea to try something different. A patient came to his practice called Lisa Cunningham, who I got to know later. And Lisa had been shut away in her home with just crippling depression for seven years she barely left the house and sam said to lisa don't worry i carry on giving you these drugs i'd also like you to try something else I'd like to come and meet a couple of times a week here at the doctor's practice to meet with a group of other depressed and anxious people not to talk about how bad you feel i mean you can do that if you want but i want you to find something you can do together that would be meaningful so the first time the group met lisa literally vomited with anxiety it was just so much for her but there was an area behind the doctor's surgery that was just scrub scrubland. And they start talking, and these are inner city East London people who didn't know anything about gardening, but they were like, we could turn this into a garden. That'd be a nice thing to do. So they started to get books out the library. They started to watch clips on YouTube about, about gardening. And they started to get their fingers in the soil. They started to learn the rhythms of the seasons. Um, you know, uh, they, 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 they started to reconnect with the natural world. They've been cut off from it for a very long time. There's a lot of evidence that kind of interacting with the natural world is a profoundly healing antidepressant. The way Lisa put it to me, as the garden began to bloom, we began to bloom. The most effective strategies for dealing with depression and anxiety are the ones that deal with the reasons why we're depressed and anxious in the first place. They're the ones that respect the signal that listen to the signal and solve the underlying problem. What we've been doing up to now, way too much of the time, is pathologizing the signal and insulting the signal and saying it's a sign of weakness or it's a sign of craziness or it's purely a biological malfunction. When in fact, that, that's a way too simplistic a way of understanding what this problem is. And it leads us therefore to find the wrong. If you, if you don't have an accurate map, you can't find your way through the territory, right? And because we've given people an inaccurate map of their problem or a very limited map of their problem, it's not totally inaccurate. There are some biological contributions. It's always important to stress that. But 
you know, we've, we, we've, um, we've neglected the real, we've neglected to explain the real problem. Mm. 